uh, behind the screens and do make your way forward. It'd be lovely to have you in the space here. And if you don't want to make your way forward, could I just encourage you maybe to um, just to hush your voices just a tiny bit. This is such a strange space where it can be hard to be heard, but it can also be hard not to be heard. So um, we sometimes find that people who are well at the back of the cathedral, who feel that clearly their conversation can't be heard at the front, um, can sometimes have a bit of an impact on the, on, the, uh, on, on the ability of people to concentrate on what's being heard from the front. So um, I'm simply here as the Dean of the Cathedral in order to welcome you here and uh, as a member of the Lord Mayor's Peace Committee um, to welcome uh, you to the Lord Mayor's Peace Lecture. And we're absolutely delighted that we have in um, Councillor John McNicholas this year's Coventry Lord Mayor, somebody who's extremely engaged with the work of the Peace Committee and is uh, in a moment going to take over the welcoming and hosting of this evening's event. Um, thank you to the members of the Corps Cymraeg Coventry, the Coventry Welsh Choir, who have been singing for us, um, which has been absolutely delightful. Apologies to you for, uh, for people not completely sitting down and, and giving you uh, perhaps as much attention as your singing deserved, but it has been absolutely lovely. So would you like to just show your appreciation for, um, for our singers this evening? Thank you. And, uh, and we do very much hope that we'll have an opportunity to listen to you again. Um, this evening's Lord Mayor's Peace Lecture ha ha is, uh, once again, as has been the case in recent years, coming within the rising Global Peace Forum, um, uh, very much led from the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University, but offered in partnership with both the Cathedral and Coventry City Council a really important of our uh, part of our shared life over six years now uh, and uh, having an increasing global impact and all sorts of um, uh, uh, occurrences, uh, events um, from this movement that happened not just here in Coventry but over the world. And once again this year we've gathered an amazing collection of people, um, including my own senior boss, of, of course, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury himself, somebody that's, been, that's delivered this lecture in the past, but um, uh, was here lecturing for us this morning. And I think I'm right in saying that the material is available online if you'd like to access it. So if you search around Rising Global Peace Forum, then you'll be able to find that. Um, so, uh, and, that and the programme continues tomorrow. There are plenty of programmes at the back, so if there are events you'd like to come back into tomorrow, then you would be more than welcome. Uh, there are so many more things that I could say. I'm going to resist the urge. I'm going to hand over to our Lord, the Lord Mayor of Coventry, Councillor John McNicholas, to introduce our guest speakers for this evening. <coughs> Thank you, Dean, and Lady Mares, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. John said about the choir, Cork and Rye. They were wonderful in my hearing, and I thank them uh, for what they offered, some very stirring Welsh songs. John also reminded me about the Archbishop's contribution to the Peace Forum this morning. Very, very thought-provoking, and I can really recommend, if you haven't seen it, please do so. The whole conference itself is thought-provoking. I had the opportunity of listening to a refugee who came to this country in 2001 on the back of a lorry. And he uh, related his experiences of living in Afghanistan and the fear and the reasons why he came over to this country. And he was welcomed in Coventry and was asked, how long does it take to become a Coventrian? 24 hours, he replied. And that in itself reminds me of the warmth 
and the welcome Coventry offers many, many cultures, many, many faiths. We are, after all, the city of peace and reconciliation, and we live up to our name. And I am proud of Coventry for what it does, what it offers to the people of the world. And of course, the spotlight is on Coventry this year. It's the reason why I took the role of Lord Mayor, because we are city of culture. What a fantastic time we're having. And this is part of that, because uh, the Peace Lecture has been going on for some considerable time and has its rightful place in Coventry's calendar. I like the Archbishop this morning, I'd better go back on script. So welcome to a highlight of our annual Peace Festival, the Lord Mayor's Peace Lecture. It is a night to challenge and inspire to make us all think of peace in its many forms. And I am so looking forward to hearing from tonight's speakers, as we have not had one, but we've got two special guests from our own city of Coventry. As the home of Two Tone, Coventry was topping the charts in the late 70s and early 80s. Our bands were filling the dance floors, but they were doing so much more than that. Two-Tone brought people of different cultures together. Coventry has always been a proud multicultural city, and the music of those days helped to bridge divides, and it still does. Today, we welcome two of our city's true musical icons, Neville and Christine Staple, who will give a talk entitled the Sounds of Unity, Ya So. As a member of the specials, Neville's writing and vocal skills helped bring new style to the charts and a new togetherness on our streets. Christine has been writing, producing, and performing in film, video, and music since her teens and uses her talents to promote peace and diversity. Coventry is proud of them both. So proud to be the home of Tutum. The music, the fashion, and the whole movement united different cultures at a time when racial tensions were high. It changed attitudes not just in our city, but around the UK and the world. And on top of all that, it was great to listen to. I look forward to hearing Neville and Christine's thoughts on how their music achieved all of that and how it continues today. And what better place to listen to our peace lecture than our beautiful cathedral that sits alongside the inspiring ruins and is known worldwide as a symbol of peace and reconciliation. Over the years, the Lord Mayor's Peace Lecture has seen our city welcome leading figures such as Michael Mopogu, Jonathan Parrott, Yasmin Alibai Brown and Paul R. Stryker. And I am delighted that Neville and Christine have agreed to join that distinguished list. Thank you all for your support for tonight's event and for your support for our Peace Lecture, which is such an important time in our calendar. Enjoy the evening and my very best wishes for a happy and peaceful future. With that, let me introduce Christine and Neville. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> lighten the mood a bit. 
and say just thank you everyone for supporting us. Thank you our Lord Mayor, Lady Mayoress and all you wonderful people for coming out this evening to join us. Um, you could be at home having a cup of tea, couldn't you? <laughs> so, I'll be rested. Yes. So I'm Sugary Staple, also known as Christine Sugary Staple, and this is my wonderful husband, Dr. Neville Staple, who you all, I'm sure, know and love as much as I do. The original rude boy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's going to play up. <laughs> be prepared. He's going to play up tonight. Why not? Yeah. Uh, so we're going to just open up now by, first of all, I would like to say, I want to apologise. This is a slightly altered version of what we were going to do for you tonight. A lot of you who are on my, I see a few familiar faces, who are on my social media will know that I've been hacked recently. They've taken over my cyber world completely, files, all sorts, including stuff for here and a university thing I've got on next week and so on. Uh, they've stolen money. So I'm literally at odds ends at the moment. So we've put together an alternative. It's still covering the whole Yasso that we wanted to talk to you about and the here and now music that we bring, um, but it's slightly different. So please bear with us. We're hoping that our lovely technical team, Fran, and his assistant there, or his mate there, um, will help us get through these slides really well. So we're gonna start by opening with a little bit of history. A short clip, please. You wanna sit down, you wanna stay up? On August 5th, 1962, Princess Margaret finally pulled down the Union Jack after more than 300 years of British rule in Jamaica. The soundtrack to this newfound freedom was the first truly Jamaican music, a newly invented ska. The story of modern Jamaican music starts in the early 1950s in the poorer areas of downtown Kingston with the emergence of a uniquely Jamaican phenomenon, still at the heart of the music 50 years later, the sound system. Uh, so, you all saw Yasso, or Yasso, or how Neville would say it. Yasso. Yasso. Okay. So, that's basically saying right here, right now. So, for us, the music's always been about here and now. So, from the two-tone phenomenon of music uh, to stuff I grew up with, it's all about talking about you, talking about me, talking about us, so that we all can be a collective like one voice, one song that can mean so much to so many of us, which it often makes a hit song, uh, and that can be just silly little lyrics, or it could be something with more um, importance to what we're going through in everyday life, like the two-tone music. So Neville grew up in Jamaica, where the sound system was actually like providing the news, wasn't it, Neville? Yeah, um, even in England, coming from Jamaica, we had our sound system, which I've always toasted. Toast is what you might think is rap, but I've always toasted from a very early age and straight up to the Jabadis before that, like I said, I used to DJ, toasting, stuff like that. Yeah, so back in Jamaica, oh and I need to point out, I do apologise, um, Neville asked me to mention this. Uh, most of you again know Neville's had two or three strokes, so sometimes you will see me prompting him. Uh, I might kick him now and again, but that's just me. <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so I may prompt him now and again or jump in and, and um, assist him with some of the memories and things that he has to say. But a lot of you know I already do that. So yeah, the whole toasting um, and lyrical messages were um, in early Jamaica and other Caribbean islands, but predominantly Jamaica. Um, the music would go out there in the street, house of joy, massive speakers. And those people had to have charisma. The person delivering, it, it was often news. It was important political messages. It was sometimes just silly things. Sometimes it was important things that they made fun of. But basically music would play and the DJ would have the microphone and literally chat, as you would call it, isn't it? Chatting Ch lyrics. Uh, chatting lyrics. Yes, so you would just say what's happening around you moan about the system, moan about being poor or moaning about, you know, I don't know, rich neighbourhood coming in and taking your land and it was all done and I mean a lot of this went way, way back to beyond slavery times where being in the fields you sung to just, you know, just to keep on. yourself going, yeah. you would chant and go on about things. So this is something that's always been in black culture. But so the early sound system days was all about providing news, it, a bit of fun, wasn't it? Yeah, because in Jamaica we're where I was born, in, in the um, mountains, 
if we didn't have newspaper or anything like that. So if I wanted to say something or tell somebody about what was happening around the area, I would do chat. Yes. Milan chat. Sorry. <laughs> I, would, I would chat. Right? So I would give you a message what's been happening uh, around the area, which is how we used to do it in Jamaica. At the time, no newspaper. So you came really young. You brought that knowledge with you. I mean, you was literally primary school age, wasn't you, when oh, you yeah. came, but yeah, you had definitely. that knowledge with you. So, of course, once Neville arrived in Coventry, first arrived in rugby, came to Coventry and started his own sound system culture of Coventry. Uh, and you were probably one of the youngest on the circuit at the time, I hear. Um, yes, I was. And I was, was spotted by people like Ray King and stuff. So I think even if the specials hadn't happened, Neville was already doing some work and music and singing and chatting with Ray do, King I, anyway, wasn't yeah, you? Yeah, I was always doing that. I was always putting the lyrics Absolutely. out and stuff like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Next slide, please. So this is some of the uh, early stuff at the Hollyhead Youth Club. Up there on the right is Neville in front of his Jabadis sound system speakers. They're the House of Joys that we've got at the house in Jamaica. Uh, that we've got up in the mountains. Bear in mind, Neville hates heights. This ha house is really <laughs> high up in the mountains. Yes. So I don't yeah. know how you hi hate heights so much. Um, so that's us in Jamaica, and then that's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure the boy's name, but he was um, part of the Hollyhead Youth Club in Coventry, and he's sitting on one of the huge Jabadi, I mean, these yeah. speakers um, are sometimes, this side just one, and then you stack another on top, and often another. Sometimes the you same need scaffold thing, just to build it. Same thing, I, I remember him, but because my memory is shot, uh, most, of the, most of the guys um, who was with Jobadis, if I see them, their name will come to me. But because my memory is just shot, yeah. it's sugary. Yeah, no problem. But we don't have to remember everyone's name. So, so basically, the reason we're speaking about sound systems is that was a way of getting people together. People would come from all over the mountains, like Neville said, the different parts of the country, to, just to hear a sound system playing the music and sharing lyrics about life in general and trying to feel better about each other. So it, it created this kind of unified voice for everyone. I mean, sometimes it also caused a clash because people would be on opposing sides, a bit like you know, politicians arguing. This was like street politics. Um, but that's what made it Yasso. It was here, it was now, it was right here with what you were experiencing today. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, we're just going to play a little bit of a video clip, please. When Jamaican music first arrived here in the 60s, it spoke mainly to the West Indian community. Ska and early reggae were little more than novelties, though they offered a new soundtrack for the working class teens, black and white. But during the 70s, British reggae came out on the streets. It joined forces with rock and then punk, a rebel sound that was changing British music. And by the 80s had become a mirror for the cultural and racial changes that were transforming Britain, while Britain transformed and absorbed reggae into the mainstream. that kind of relates to what we were saying about the families that came. Neville came with his, to meet his family over here at a young age and that culture sort of came with him and came with lots of other people. Um, and in a lot of the inner city areas, this music gelled, like they said in the clip, with a lot of the working classes. There was a connection there and it was um, everything from the young skinheads. And when I say skinheads, a lot of people go, ooh. Most of you here, especially if you're in Covent, from Coventry, you know that the original young skinheads were literally guys who were very much into the Jamaican sound. They liked to look tough. Yes, they shaved their hair or had suede heads, as they called it back then. And they embraced the whole Jamaican culture as well as other cultures. And it was sort of later in the 70s when sort of National Front and other groups were taking over that a lot of them, for their tough image and their street styles, got recruited up by um, lots of far-right groups, um, which is how the whole um, bad culture of the skinhead was pretty much born around that time. And I witnessed this around friends I had at the time in London, because I wasn't always in Coventry. Do you want to say something about that, babes? The toasting? Yeah. Well, but like in the, uh, like you say, the um, skinhead, but we used to get some skinheads that was like the ruffians who wanted to fight National Front 
But then you used to get them at the concert, and after a while, listen to the music, then they listen to the lyrics after and the dancing, and we used to have a lot of trouble. But I like Sugar says, after a while, we would get them who loved the music, and they'd listen to the lyrics, and they'll think, yes. Yes. But a lot of people used to get them, like skinheads, they used to think they're all ruffians, but they wasn't. No, and I grew up where there was a mixture of mods, skinheads, sound boys, you name it, a lot of mixed cultures in inner city London. Uh, so we had the same sort of thing, but we did have friends of ours, or who we assumed were friends, sort of got recruited over. Mm. But a lot of them came back when two-tone hit. So a bit like what Neville was saying, that yes, there was um, this sort of National Front thing going on, a lot of race, racism going on, but it was also a time where there was a lot of troubles in the UK in general with minor strikes and high unemployment as we got nearer and nearer towards the 80s. So a bit like with the Brexit time and all the rest of it, which you'll see a little bit of that later, um, people start to get a little bit like they need to have a blame culture. They, they blame others for what's going on around them. It, it's sort of a human instinct for many. Um, and we think that was a lot of what was going on at the time during those tough days. Um, yeah, let's have a... The, oh, that was, by the way, some... Uh, sorry, can we just go back one? Sorry. That was some of the stage invasions that were going on. So what Neville was saying about a lot of these fans, they were very much... Um, it started with a lot of trouble. He had like people seek Eileen and everything in, in some of the early clubs that they were performing in. Right. And you, you end up in some fights as well, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, we're not condoning. condoning it. <laughs> but um, because I wasn't used to um, people spitting at me or Zeke Eileen, Zeke Eileen. Like I'm on stage here now, there used to be um, the bad skinheads. They used to Zeke Eil, spit. And if they would get on stage, they'd want to fight. But then, because two-turn was not about fighting, it was getting together. So when I used to get all of this, it got really bad one, once it got so bad, there's about 20 of them. Zeke Islands, about 20, 10 of them spitting. So I had to jump in, I didn't have to, but because I weren't used to that, I jumped in and, um, I kind of sorted it out. Yeah. No, and then, <laughs> and then the true fans got them out as well. And that but kind of started a trend, didn't it? it because did. you, what happened after that is a lot of fans were actually dealing with it for them. Yeah. So if they saw, you know, these people coming in to disrupt a show, they would, they they would, would actually help. get rid of yeah. them. And I think I've even seen a little bit of that in sort of modern days, sort of later on in life. Um, again, that might come up later. Mm. So yeah, that, that's what that is. So it went from um, the performing and dealing with all this abuse, literally it was abusive, to on the left there you'll see they started to have stage invasions. The fans were at one <laughs> with the, the specials. Best. They were in unity with you. I just about but see the at the top there getting a bit squashed I up. Know, but at the same time, when they used to come on stage, there were so many that came on stage, um, one time, the stage collapsed because we used to let them come up and dance, get together. So one time, um, we got loads of them on stage. The stage collapsed. And what did we do? We still kept on kept playing. playing. You'd never get away with it now. Yeah. And a lot of people know that my degree and my qualifications is health and safety management. I would never let you do it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I haven't got that hat on today. Let's have a little look at the clip of a stage invasion from back then. Stomping. Are you ready? Start stomping!
<laughs> that brings my circle of <laughs> yeah. memory. Rest in peace, John Bradbury there. Yeah, so that brings me on to sort of my past. That's me, as you can see. Um, that's the bedroom where Nev was my pin-up, who'd know sort of 30-odd years later I'd meet him and marry him. But this whole two-tone phenomenon put the Coventry on the map for me um, as a young girl in, in London. And I was very much into it. That's me on the left in the red top, in case you didn't recognise me. <laughs> um, and I was very much, I was quite a tomboy as well, but I was very much, I mean, I saw Neville, fell in love instantly. He was my pin-up. Um, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't know what happened years later, but <laughs> no. Um, so, and, um, yeah, so the whole um, two-tone phenomenon hit, hit us hard in London and put commentary on the map. I couldn't wait to see them. I tried to see them. Uh, I was a little bit young for most gigs. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so that was the gig where I, I listened from outside, the one on the left, that was in uh, Camden. Yeah, and the one on the right, I used to do a lot of marching and, and sort of socialist movement stuff. So we did a march up in Leeds, and that's when I finally got to see them properly, and that was absolutely amazing. I do remember um, this one, though. The one on, yeah, the electric ballroom, yeah. I think you've filmed in there lots of times since yeah. then as well. So, um, so, yeah, it hit us hard. It gave me a, a sense of identity because we were growing up around people. And again, it was the here and now. We had a lot of punks on my estate. We had a lot of sound, um, sound system guys. We had some rusters there, mods and scooterists. Um, and most of us just went rudy, literally overnight, because it embraced all the things we were used to. I grew up with a mixed gym music. I've got mixed parentage. Um, family from England, Scotland, um, the Caribbean. So I was already growing up with a lot of, um, I don't know, country and western stuff, wasn't it? Our, our parents play, but my mum loves Scar, yeah. Prince Buster, all those kinds, Stranger Cole, Derek Morgan. So I'm, I grew up with a lot of that sound. And even those early Scar sounds from Jamaica had that, that theme where they were talking to you. You knew what they were talking about. It hit you. You knew everything they were saying in those songs. And whether it was a love song or whether it was just having a go at a neighbour, because sometimes the songs were kind of silly. You know, they're just moaning about a neighbour next door who's given them the ump. But you knew, because you had a neighbour somewhere like that. So it was quite interesting, and that's how um, it hit us. But more importantly, it was that connection, that unity message from Two Tone. That's what got us more than anything else. Next slide, please. We were united on the dance floor, dressed to kill, and if only for a moment, it felt like colour didn't matter. Beautiful. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? The two-tone times. Oh, yeah. Well, um, when the two-tone came, I, I just loved it because I wasn't used to mixing in a group I used to have white friends, Asian friends, but the two-tone brought us closer together. And that was one thing I loved about two-tone. I wasn't used to it. I used to have a lot of um, different nationality friends at school. But when I left school, that's when I used to see the rough part and the good part. So two-tone, for me, brought everything together. Black, white, Asian, all different culture. Absolutely. Next slide, please. So this is the, um, the famous Bucks Stadium Racial Harmony gig of 1981. Uh, and that's uh, Melanie there up in the top <laughs> picture, along with, uh, is Mark, Cum is it Cummings? Michael. Michael Cummings and Mark uh, Domican. And uh, this was when there was a lot of stuff. Did we, did we, we missed a slide. Can I just go back one, please? Yeah, this. Uh... Oh, yeah. So if you look at the bottom, the, the, there's Neville and Terry and the band performing up on the left and obviously the bottom. Some of you may have seen these photos before. They've been on exhibition before. But there's all the trouble that's going on outside because what happened, this was a racial harmony gig. And again, a lot of you will know that the um, police were worried, so they came out in full force because yeah. some far-right groups promised to come and just smash anyone's head in if they went along to this uh, peace. But at the same time, um, in commentary, we, we played the butts as specials. But um, in town, the National Front marched down to the butts and tried to stop the show. But we kept on, we carry on with the show, but there weren't as many people as it would have been because the National Front frightened them. But that was one peace gig we tried to do, Rock Against Racism, 
at the butts in commentary. Yeah. And we did do it. That was brilliant. And that's that's what I love, the fact that they continued with it. And yeah. there was determined people outside who said, no, we will go. We want to be in there and we're going to go in there. Mm. And I think because of that, I mean, I've heard from lots of witnesses that were there at the time and from you, Neville, um, where because people stood together and stood firm and said, no, no, you're not going to disrupt this. This is us. This is for us, the people of Coventry. Eventually, the National Front members did fizzle out. I mean, there was still some trouble in town, which is where those pictures come from. But overall, the show went on. Next slide, please. So again, that's everyone enjoying themselves. As you can see, lovely mixed crowd. It that's actually worked great. See that? That's my daughter up there. Yeah. <laughs> Looking great, Mel. Yeah. Uh, and the next slide, please. And this is like 40 years on. Yes. So what an amazing thing. We got them all together again, uh, the three of them, to stand in the exact same place at the Butts Stadium. And this is 40 years on. It's the anniversary this year. So here they are, still able to hug and enjoy each other's yeah, company. Yeah. So you know that this is Coventry, it's a great picture. right? It's a lovely picture. Yeah, absolutely. Next slide, please. Uh, so. This is what we want to point out. Obviously, you've got some Brexit stuff going on, some other far-right stuff going on, all sorts of stuff going on there, a bit more chaos over on the left. So while a lot of this is going on outside, next slide, please. This is what we're doing inside. Would you like to play that, please? So this is another stage invasion in our modern times. This is in the recent few years ago at the Belgrade Theatre. Yeah. Would that not go any bigger, please? No, the stage didn't collapse, but we did get in a lot of trouble for allowing that to happen. It was great fun. But I, the, I was told not to. <laughs> I was told not to call them on stage, but because I was used to that, come and join us. Because they, oh, you're they, rude. It's not because you're used to. You're no, just naughty. They, you like to no, be they nice. wanted to come on stage. So I said, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, never, never, never sticks to the rules. Um, okay, so uh, right. So this is Gary. So. Basically, what we're saying here is the Yaso is about here and now. This is about lyrics that impact on our everyday life. And more importantly, it's the power of music. So throughout these slides we've been showing you, it's that power, it's music having that message. It's people getting together because of music. And, you know, a lot of you will see that with fashion. You might have in the 80s, I don't know, been new romantics and you all dressed a certain way, you hung out together and you had a that joint message. So we're talking about the power of the type of music where we're literally is the narration of the life you're living in and how you're getting through each day. So this is Gary. Now, as it says, the National Front Skinner during the 70s and 80s. Gary is um, a DJ who's pretty well known now and uh, he travels all over the place as a DJ and he's a very good friend of ours, believe it or not. Now, Gary was hanging out with um, a lot of National Fronts and got recruited and he used to play music and DJ for these different far-right groups. And then one day, in his regular day job, he got on great with this Jamaican friend who he worked with. And they were chatting about the music, and, and the Skinner culture has always enjoyed Jamaican music, regardless of whether they went to the National Front side or the more liberal side. Um, and they were chatting about these famous artists that they loved, and they were singing along at work, literally in the warehouse, to all these songs they both knew. And they got on great, they started having coffee and lunch together. Then one day, Gary had this epiphany and thought, what am I doing? He was going on his way to one of his National Front groups and he was just so surprised at himself because he suddenly realised, this is ridiculous. I'm here causing all kinds of havoc. 
um, instead of bringing peace to people. So he literally, can I have the next slide, please? He, he became a sharp skinhead, and what that means is skinheads against racial prejudice. Okay, and then he travelled, he's literally travelled the world with his own money to take that message of unity all around the globe, literally. Next slide, please. And that's him at the press, where they actually make the vinyl, because he's very much into vinyl, like we are um, in Jamaica, Gong Records. He literally went right into the heart of these places, into Kingston Town, Trench Town, everywhere. Mm -hmm. He's been to India, all over the place. Next slide, please. This is in with us at my Skarmouth events that I run, and that's all about unity. I don't know if you've heard of Skarmouth, but that's something I, aside from the acting and the performing with Neville and managing, I run um, Skarmouth, and Neville's our biggest supporter. These are some of the artists, Stranger Cole and the Ethiopians, some old time sort of Scar stars that came, and Gary couldn't wait to meet them. Next slide, please. And here we come to, so that was Gary's story. Yeah. Again, that's talking about the power of music. That's talking about Yasa, here, now. Feeding that to your community, looking out for your community, and joining together with things. So we didn't want to end without mentioning some of the other greats who brought peace through music, and sometimes controversial issues through music. Obviously, the great John Lennon and Bob Marley. There's obviously loads. We couldn't fit them all into one sort of short session. But because of this, we're going to um, play you something we was asked to do recently for a ch special charity. Uh, and we was asked to do this, and this was to do a piece in this charity that was asked for. Can you play the next slide, please? This is the original root boy little staple, along with sugar. Imagine! I said, imagine! Time for a dance, I think. <laughs> Do you hear that? Imagine! Say I'm a 
Well deserved applause indeed. I see my role as promoting the city. And of course, we get a year as Lord Mayor to do just that. But Christine and Neville, you've been doing that. You've been promoting the city since the early 80s on the public stage and I congratulate you for the work you have been doing. Because I realize that actually, this is Coventry's social history. And it's how the city has developed from where it was with violence, let's be honest, to where we are now, a city of peace and reconciliation, living in harmony, and the work you guys have been doing has been promoting that for, what, quick, quick maths, 40 years. And, and that, that is a, a worth, well done. And how the music developed from where it was, as it, as it was said, it was relevant, current, in the moment, to what it is today, and your version of Imagine, I hope, becomes a single, because I'm pretty sure that would be something that would be um, well followed uh, throughout the country. And of course, it would be part of Coventry, wouldn't it? Because Two Tone is the home, Coventry is the home of Two Tone. So, well done, congratulations, and it shows the power of music. So, with that, I think it's now an opportunity to ask a few questions. And Richard, you've got the roving mic, and can you help me then, because it's... Uh... So, looking for the first question. Let me kick it off, okay? What do you think when you see the music you up on the stage and the videos. What do you, what does it recall for you, in terms of the energy and the power of music that you were able to relay to the audience and their response back to you? What were your uh, thoughts at the time? At the time, um, I just thought, yeah, great, we're getting, we're getting together. But like I said, with different na nationality, because myself growing up, it wasn't that tight. So when the specials on it, it's just a thing that brought people together yeah. and looking at it now it's still going on yeah. and I love it I mean we've traveled the world we was in uh, South America a couple of years ago and I've got to say the amount of people that just yeah. knew all the lyrics all the words were screaming and jumping around it was just amazing and the messages of two-tone and the the whole unity thing was so prominent there we, it was unbelievable Colombia um, Mexico, uh, what's the other place, Brazil, all of that, and they want us to go back and perform more of it because the fans were just screaming for more, it was amazing. Well, you, you, could, see, you could see the vibrancy it's still, it's from the video, from the, yes. and the reaction of the yes. audience, and actually coming on the stage, and no wonder the stage fell apart with everybody <laughs> on the stage <laughs> itself. Yes, okay, could you ask your question please? Thank you Lord Mayor. I should break the ice. Uh, 
have to ask the question. Uh, Christina, well, I know perhaps you us know each other slightly differently, being living in the closest, closest vicinity. But the issue is here that the experience of National Front in those days in 70s and 80s. Some of us experienced very, I mean, obviously you heard everything there. I just want to ask, uh, when we had two murders here, one of them actually Dr. Telktari, his funeral was held here in those days, and then later on the Satnam Gill. Uh, that's when the whole movement of, of things started. Uh, so I'm just trying to, I, I know I, I was not, uh, I never understood that much music, English music specifically, because I, I was born in India, so I had difficulty to understand it. But I was following that all the issues, how it's going on. I'm just trying to figure out about at that time, we had a very big procession, you may remember. Were you involved with somewhere in that time? I'm just trying to understand uh, that nature of those two murders and then the start of this process uh, of uh, fighting back, rather, uh, if we put it this way. Uh, there was a huge demonstration here. I think uh, Lord Mayor have mentioned, it was Phil Robinson, uh, Phil, yeah. Phil Robinson was the Lord Mayor at that time. So there was a big procession here, he ended up by the cathedral. I'm just trying to figure out if uh, you were involved in, in uh, anywhere in that sense. Thank you. Yeah, so Neville, he's talking about the um, time when Y was out. So there's a song called Y, um, and if you look at some of the old reports from back then, you'll see that the band and Neville and the guys were talking about those very cases. Um, as well as one of the members of the specials, um, Limbal, also was really badly attacked. Um, it was a very nasty attack, and he ended up in hospital and stuff. But yes, the, the two gentlemen who were fatally hurt, that was all part of the whole thing around why, wasn't it? About the, the whole racial abuse <laughs> yeah, thing, wasn't yeah. it? With those, some, those people in mind as well. Give us a, a couple of lyrics from it, Neville. Why did you try to hurt me? Tell me why, tell me why, tell me why. Did you really want to kill me? Tell me why, tell me why, tell me why. Yeah, you see? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Still has the harmony. <laughs> is it any? Yes, another one there. Thank you. Thank you. This is Neslihan from Lord Mayor's Peace Committee, also represents Turkish community in Coventry. Thank you very much for uh, showing us how uh, music can be used to promote social, uh, you know, uh, better social relations um, or promote your ideologies. Um, I am curious about what would you suggest to the young generation's musicians in terms of promoting good relations like uh, music is not just having a good time, also it can be a very useful medium tool to promote good relationship between, you know, communities, groups, so what would be your advice, I wonder? Thank you. Thank you, that's a really good question. We do a lot of that work. Um, we've spoken to ex-young offenders, we've spoken in schools and colleges, some very young, some sort of teenage years, um, and also most of you will know about what tragically happened to my step-grandson, Neville's grandson, Fidel. Um, so after that and during that time, we wrote a song called Put Away Your Knives, but we also went out and did some outreach talking to some of these young people, and there was many that are into music. And look, we know people want to have their words, they want to put their lyrics out there, and a lot of the street grime of now, some of it is, you know, great stuff, it's very poetic, and these are young people finding their way in the world and expressing themselves. But we did speak to them about why does it have to be so violent, so aggressive? If you're ang angry, find other ways to portray that in your words, you know, and look for ways that things can be fixed. Don't just be angry and you want to attack everyone or attack each other or fight in gangs or whatever. Look at something more positive, a way forward. Let your lyrics express that. Yes, get your anger out, but, but do it in such a way that people will want to respond to you and people will want to help and get involved because there's, there's this culture of just because, oh, I'm angry and I've got something to say and I'm young, that I can be really nasty and aggressive about it, but it doesn't need to be that way. The music that these guys are putting out, I mean, Concrete Jungle's talking about gangs fighting people in the street, but 
the main message of the song is that I'm not going out tonight. I don't know if I'll be all right. I want to go home and be safe. You know, so what I'm saying is it can be expressing your anger at some of the things you're having to face. But equally, let's do it in such a way that people will respond, grown-ups will respond, record labels should be responding in the right way too. Hi. Um, a couple of years ago, Coventry City Football Club uh, bought out a, a two-tone third kit, which was very well received. Um, I thought it would be a really good idea for every uh, football team to bring out a two-tone third kit uh, as there unfortunately is still a lot of racism um, in football from the fans uh, so that every football match played maybe for a season um, there was one team playing in a black and white kit, a two-tone kit to spread the word obviously that, uh, to kick it out, kick racism out of football. I just wondered what you thought about that. I think that would be a good idea, but I can't see it happening, to be honest with you. But it would be... A, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but it's a, it's a great idea, seriously. But the way football is with different teams, I don't think it will happen. But it would be great. It I would be very yeah, nice. I think that would be fantastic. I oh, think yeah. you need an entrepreneur. Any entrepreneurs in the house? I think, yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, How definitely. cool would that be? <clears throat> How cool would that be? Yeah, that's amazing. a great idea. Great yeah. idea. Yeah. Any contacts out there, let us know and we'll mm. see what we can do to help that. Because we were there, we helped launch that, along with the Two-Tone Village, you're in the house tonight. Hello, my darlings. Um, yeah, I, think, I, I love that idea. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Hello. Bobby. I'm um, representing Coventry University. Um, our question is, um, how does it feel to be able to see and know the impact that your music has years on, on the younger generation? Um, like you said before, um, yes, people are definitely angry when it comes to racism and everything, but we do feel very influenced by the things that you've said before and the things that you, ge that you preach in general. And we're, you know, it's just amazing to hear. So, yeah, how do you feel about such a wise, having such a widespread impact? Like you said, you went to like South America and everything, and you were like, wow, people know our lyrics so well. So, yeah. Yeah, and you've been doing that for years. I mean, Neville was spent nine years in the US um, and he, oh Probably my goodness, you had a whole oh, yeah. young fan base there and helped people like No Doubt, Gwen Stefani and the Rancid and lots All of young, guys, yeah, oh, yeah, lots of the, the bands were that the were, they were influenced by you, weren't yeah. they? They were into the music and what we were talking about. They heard it from coming from England, so because I was in America and I was doing what we were doing from England, the specials, they just loved it what we were saying and there's so many young fans still now I mean we were in Australia four years ago again lots of young people there um, so you're right I mean the young people listen it's the lyrics I think I'm not sure there's anything around now that gives them that same kind of uh, because the lyrics back then still relate yeah. to now yeah. you know there might be a few things that you know there's songs about um, you did about Margaret Thatcher back then but it could still be about a politician now if you've mm. got the ump with them or you're upset with them so yeah. my point is, yes, those lyrics, Ghost Town's probably one of the most played songs, wasn't it? We yeah. were requesting Concert, doing some yeah. DJ stuff this year. So, yeah, we do know. And there are a lot of young fans at our gigs, aren't they? A hell of well, a lot of young. It's good to see them yeah. as well, because the music has been passed down from their parents, so they can relate to it and uh, know what we're saying. But like Sugary says, there's a lot of different lyrics happening nowadays, which promote fighting and postcodes and all that silliness. I'm glad that we weren't, we weren't we having that We should be proud. Time. Coventry's yeah. got an amazing legacy, music-wise. Mm. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, you guys obviously have done amazing work. Um, your reach can only be as far as you can reach. Um, if you were speaking to funders now of youth services, given what you know that music can do to bring communities together. What advice would you give to funders as to how they should be deploying their resources? Yeah, I think, well, um, you've probably heard of Fridays, some of you. I mean, we was helping Fridays with their launch. We saw the guys outside earlier, actually. They came to speak to us before we came in. Um, but I, I would say that funders need to look more at, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, there's a group called Fridays. On a Friday, they say to young people, don't bother to go and hang out on the streets there. Yeah, yeah. 
Don't mess around with the gangs there. Come in here and do something artistic. You can learn to play DJ decks. You can learn to sing, play an instrument. You can have some fun in the field. We're going to be running around and doing circuit training today. And what is really great about Fridays um, is it's young people who are running it for young people. They've just had enough. They didn't want no postcode lottery of, of gang fighting and all the rest of it and feeling unsafe to go places. So they decided to create a safe space of their own. And I think that that's where I would tell funders, start looking in, look at Fridays and look at how that can be spread to even another day or two of the week. Let's show young people there's something more that they can be doing than just hanging on street corners, getting in trouble. Thanks. Um, it's fantastic having you here and talking about this. As we've said before, um, it's kind of, I grew up with this, um, well, I was already, I guess, about 18, 19 when Two Tone was really having an impact. And there's two parts to the question, really. Um, one is, um, uh, why is there so little um, mu popular music, which seems to be really making a difference in the same way that Two Tone did back uh, in the, at the end of the 70s, at the beginning of the 80s? Um, uh, when it really felt as if it kind of had a significant social impact. Um, so it's partly why is that quite hard to spot, or on the other hand, are there people that you look to as, as delivering that kind of social impact today? Are there artists or bands that make you really excited about what's happening in music today? Um, I'm going to ask uh, Sugar to say this, because when I'm talking in, um, to a crowd like this, I'm not very good in my memory as well. So. If it's a, if it's a, if you're in a gig, I'm fine. But like this, I'm not too good. So sugary. We'll get you up and sing then. Just yeah. sing your answer, yeah. Neville. <laughs> but no, seriously, um, I would say we do worry. We have got a few young bands and young artists that we're looking at, but often they start out sort of one way and go somewhere else with their music. So it's trying to keep them realizing that you know this is great what you're doing. You don't need to go off and turn it into sort of this sort of bad vibe. Um, unfortunately, because social media and technology, it's a different world we live in and everyone wants likes and follows and points for, for doing crazy outlandish stuff. So I, I believe that's a lot of the problem we've got. Um, so, but there's a few young bands, I mean, we, we can't actually announce them at the moment, but early next year you'll see us supporting and helping a couple of young uh, Coventry people come up and, and do good things. But to be honest, you guys here can be part of that. So when you hear or see, you know, young people doing great music or great artistic stuff, support them. You know, go out and see them. If you hear the Belgrades putting on some, some special event for young people, go and support them. If they see that, you know, the masses are starting to like really, you know, warm to what they're doing, it will encourage them more and they'll stay on that track, just like anything in life, really. One more, John. Okay. Hi, I, I don't have a question for you. I just have a comment. Um, I'm a big fan, I confess that. Um, and I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't take the opportunity to say this to you. I grew up, I was a teenager in Belfast in the 80s. And it was a grim, really grim time, in particular around the hunger strikes. There was, there was trouble everywhere. We couldn't even go to school properly. And your music brought us together. And I know it wasn't aimed at us. But the impact it had on us at school was phenomenal, and we've been fans ever since. So I just, I just wanted to tell you that um, while you were here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. You. That's you and your music, that yeah. is. Thank okay. you. That would seem to me to be the good point at uh, saying thank you very much, Christine thank and Neville. You. you are an inspiration. You are part of Coventry's social history and the work you have done on behalf of the city is amazing. And I thank you very much. I'm a fan. I don't know about you guys. But well done. Thank you. Thank you. But it shows had a two-tone movement, has become a worldwide movement from your experiences, Australia, America, and so on. And it changed attitudes, as I said earlier. I mean, we are the city 
of peace and reconciliation, but I would add friendship. I would add the fact that we are a multicultural young city. Uh, I've relayed this on quite a few occasions now, but I, Lady Morris and I attended a Pan-African event and there were Chinese, there were Asian, there were Indian, and an imam said to me, Coventry is unique. It is the city of peace and harmony. And the work that you guys have done have helped us take that forward on behalf of Coventry. And we are renowned across the world for the work that we do on behalf of all our communities in the city. And I've been privileged to announce that we have an exclusive. Christian, would you like to explain a bit more? Sure. Um, so every time we do a music video, new album and so on, we always make sure we film a music video in Coventry and we also put uh, some history behind the music videos. So we've done all sorts of videos, filming around here, in Council House before, uh, St Mary's Guild Hall, and all around different parts of Coventry. So uh, all of you know the first album that Neville put out with the specials uh, called The Specials. Uh, the front cover was done by the famous Chalky Davis in the Canal Basin. All looking up just above where the Tin Club sits now. So our brand new video that no one has seen yet, so you're getting an exclusive tonight. We're going to play it for you now uh, as an ending finale for you, okay? And it was filmed at the Tin Club um, by some wonderful guys from Leicester, but they came into commentary to do this for us. This is Celebrate. It's on the brand new album that's out in December. <coughs> Want to say something? Yeah, my throat's dry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> gone. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm going I'm, I'm to have to order a really nice dinner now. You won't be able to tell me no. Um, yeah, so this is um, Celebrate from the brand new album, which is out uh, this December. Thank you. Thanks. Party people, listen up! Let's all go and celebrate. We got a date, let's stay out late. It's party time, let's hold on tight. Until the morning light. Don't be shy. Do what you want to do. It's your time. Let's celebrate you. It's been a long time since we had a day. It's been a long time since we had some fun. No fussing. It's party time. We're gonna celebrate till the night is done. Let's all go and celebrate. We got a day. Let's say a day. Friends you wanna see, and friends you wanna meet. The party's on, and we're feeling sweet. It's been a long time since we had a day. It's been a long time since we had some fun. No fussing, it's party time. We're gonna celebrate till the night is done. Let's all go and celebrate. We got a day, let's stay out late. Ladies and gentlemen, Christine and Neville Staple. Well done. Well done.
Congratulations. Well done. I'm not quite sure what the time is. I think we may have finished a little bit early, but there's an opportunity for us to have a chat afterwards. I'm sure Christine and Neville will be uh, happy to answer any questions on an individual basis. Thank you very much for coming along this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I know you have. Uh, I'm looking forward to next year. Thank you very much.